The story that you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts, featuring characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. In 1990, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, located in Boston, Massachusetts, was the scene of an art heist that still remains to be solved to this day. It's one of the most well-known museum robberies in modern history. And, given that the art museum houses important works of art, it's incredible that they got away with it in the first place. After the FBI discovered a plot by Boston criminals to loot the museum in 1982, the institution dedicated funds to increase security. 60 infrared motion detectors and a closed-circuit television system, with four cameras positioned around the building's perimeter, were among the upgrades. There were no cameras installed within, as the Board of Trustees thought installing such equipment in the historical building would be too expensive. In addition, more security guards were hired. Despite these improvements, the only way to summon police to the museum was to press a button at the security desk. In 1988, an independent security consultant examined the museum's operations and concluded that they were on level with most other museums but that they might be improved. The security director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston also recommended that the museum be upgraded in terms of security. The Board of Trustees did not approve the security enhancements due to the museum's financial difficulties and Mrs. Gardner's objection to any major renovations. The board also denied a request from the security director for higher guard salaries in a bid to attract more qualified applicants for the job. The current guards were paid slightly above minimum wage. The security flaws of the museum were an open secret among the guards. In the early morning of March 18, 1990, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum theft occurred. The men claimed they were Boston police officers and that they had been assigned to investigate reports of a disturbance within the museum grounds. The two strangers quickly overpowered, handcuffed, and gagged with duct tape the security guards. Then, they just marched in and stole what they wanted. They ended up snatching 13 pieces of art in the end. An oversight in the museum's security preparations aided the robbers. All alarm systems within the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum were strictly internal, designed to alert on-site security personnel without summoning authorities, with the exception of a panic button linked to Boston Police Headquarters, which security personnel had no chance to use during the robbery. As a result, the criminals were able to conduct their heist without interruption, and they finished by removing the surveillance tape from the museum's cameras before leaving. The burglars were described as two Caucasian males in their 40s with black hair and false mustaches by museum security officials. The shorter of the two spoke with a Boston accent and wore square-rimmed gold-framed spectacles. Rick Abbath, 23 years old, and Randy Heston, 25 years old, were the museum guards on duty that night. Abbath was a regular night watchman and Heston was doing his first night shift. The robbers arrived around 1.20 a.m parked their car, and walked up to the side door. They pushed the buzzer, which activated an intercom with Abbath. They stated to Abbath that they were police officers who needed to be buzzed in because they were investigating a disturbance. On the closed-circuit television, Abbath could see them dressed in what appeared to be authentic police clothes. He was not aware of any disturbance, but speculated that because it was St. Patrick's Day, a reveler might have gone over the fence and have been observed and reported. At 1.24 a.m., Abbath let the man in. The thieves were let into a secured foyer between the side door and the museum. They came up to Abbath at his desk and inquired if there was anyone else in the museum and if they could bring them down. Abbath radioed Heston to return to the security desk. Around this moment, Abbath noted that the taller man's mustache appeared to be fake. The shorter man told Abbath that he looked familiar and that they might have an arrest warrant out for him and that he should step out from behind the desk and provide identification. Abbath nodded and moved away from the desk where the lone panic button for calling the cops was located. Abbath was pushed against the wall, his legs spread and he was handcuffed. He was in frisk, which Abbath observed and around this time, Heston entered the room and the taller thief 
turned him around and handcuffed him. The robbers confessed their true intentions to rob the museum once both guards were detained and urged the guards not to cause them any difficulties. The guards' heads and eyes were wrapped with duct tape by the thieves. They took the guards into the basement, shackled to a steam pipe and a workbench without asking for directions. The robbers looked through the guards' wallets and said that they knew where they lived and that they would earn a reward in about a year if they didn't tell authorities anything. It took the thieves 11 minutes to subdue the guards. It was now about 1.35 a.m. Infrared motion detectors documented the burglars' movements throughout the museum. Steps in the first room they entered, the Dutch room on the second floor, were not recorded until 1.48 a.m. This was 13 minutes after they finished subduing the guards, perhaps waiting to make sure no police were alerted. As the robbers neared the paintings in the Dutch room, a device began beeping, which normally goes off when a client approaches an artwork too closely. It was destroyed by the thieves. They destroyed the glass frames of the storm on the Sea of Galilee and the lady and gentleman in black by throwing them on the marble floor. They sliced the canvases off their stretchers using a blade. A big Rembrandt self-portrait oil painting was also removed from the wall, but it was left leaning against the cabinet. Investigators believed it was too large to carry since it was painted on wood rather than the more durable canvas used by the others. Instead, the burglar stole a Rembrandt self-portrait etching the size of a postage stamp that was on display beneath the larger portrait. On the right side of the room, they removed landscape with obelisk and the concert from their frames. The final piece taken from the room was an ancient Chinese goo. While one burglar remained in the Dutch room until 1.51 a.m., the other went to the other end of the second floor to a short hallway known as the Short Gallery. Soon after, the other thief arrived. They began removing screws from a frame hanging a Napoleonic flag in this chamber, most likely in an attempt to take the flag. They appeared to have given up partway through, as just the exposed eagle finial atop the flagpole was removed. Five Dega sketches were also taken from the room. Chester Tony, from the blue room on the first floor, was the most recent work taken. During the thieves' time at the museum, the motion detectors in the blue room did not detect any movement. The only footsteps detected in the room that night were Abbott's during the two times he passed through the gallery on his patrol earlier. The thieves checked on the guards one more time as they prepared to leave, asking if they were comfortable. They then went to the security director's office and took the video cassettes and data printouts from the motion detecting equipment that had recorded their entrance on the closed circuit cameras. The movement data was still saved on a hard drive that had never been used. Chess Tony's frame was left on the security director's desk. The thieves then proceeded to remove the artwork from the museum, opening the side entrance doors once at 2.40 a.m. and once more at 2.45 a.m. When the next shift of guards came later that morning, they recognized something was wrong when they couldn't get in touch with anyone on the inside. They called in a security director who found no one at the watch desk when he entered the premises with his keys and contacted the cops. The guards were still bound in the basement when the police raided the building. The stolen pieces were originally procured by Isabella Stewart Gardner, a prominent American art collector, philanthropist, and patron of the arts and were intended for permanent display at the museum alongside the rest of her collection. The art heist has never yielded any strong leads and it remains a mystery. However, it has been suggested that it was carried out by a New England-based organized crime ring. It's possible that the artwork has already been sold and are displayed in a private collection. It was considered the largest museum heist in terms of value until it was surpassed by the Dresden Green Vault burglary in 2019. The thieves had to make two trips to the car during the theft. The art heist took only 81 minutes from start to completion. The loot is estimated at $500 million by the FBI, and the museum is offering a $10 million reward for information leading to the art's recovery, the highest reward ever provided by a private organization. The reward is for information that leads directly to the recovery of all items in good condition. Federal prosecutors have stated that anyone who willingly returns the items will not be prosecuted. 
The statute of limitations expired in 1995 as well, so the thieves and anyone who participated in the theft cannot be prosecuted. Hey everyone, I just wanted to say that I am incredibly grateful that you took time out of your schedule to listen to my narration. This is Naki of Twisted Mind, wishing you a great rest of your day. Salamat.